All right, well, thank you for joining us for 15 most important presidential decisions. I'm Jamie, the adult program coordinator at the Deerfield Public Library. And I want to give a warm welcome to Gary Midkiff, college professor, lecturer, political analyst, author, and chef. Good evening, and welcome to my presentation on 15 greatest presidential decisions. We start with a quote from Harry Truman. I am here to make decisions and whether or not they prove right or wrong, I am going to make them. Harry Truman was one of my favorite presidents and there were times that it seemed he almost sought out decisions to make and we're going to talk about a couple of his decisions as a matter of fact this evening. We have to go through some definitions and parameters of where this set of decisions came from. Uh, keep in mind, by the way, that there is a larger set of decisions, 25 of them, uh, when I have a couple of hours to talk this evening, we have a bit less time than that. And I also have the mini version, which is 10 greatest decisions, but we're going to cover all 10 of those when we get to the 15. First, we need a definition of a decision. It needs to be a choice from a set of alternatives. So for example, when we were attacked at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, and the next day Franklin Roosevelt asked the Congress to declare war, that wasn't really a decision. He didn't really have another choice. So that does not count as a decision. Um, also, a decision needs to be identified with one president. For example, if we were to talk about the tragedy of Vietnam, we would actually have to talk about six US presidents, Harry Truman extending through Gerald Ford, all of whom had a hand in the debacle of Vietnam. Um, in addition to that, we only are gonna talk about decisions that were made at least 30 years ago, which may sound a bit arbitrary, but let me explain. Sometimes you don't know if a decision is good or bad. And I'll give you an example. In the first two years of the Obama administration, something called the Affordable Care Act was passed. And since then, it has been attacked in various ways. And we don't really know yet whether it's going to survive, whether it's going to be significantly altered, whether it will be remembered as a signature action that Obama took or whether it's going to disappear from the history books. We just don't know. With the passage of time, however, we will know for sure. So none of these decisions are within the past 30 years. We have some good decisions and we have some bad decisions. The word great is used to define a significant impact on American history. So these are not all good decisions. Two thirds of them are, but not all of them are good decisions. So those are kind of our guidelines. We're gonna go through chronologically we're going to start with George Washington. We're going to finish with, let me verify who we finish with. Yep, we finish with Richard Nixon. So that is the extent of the range that we go. I also try to balance so that we don't spend too much time with any one president. So we do have a couple from Harry Truman. Uh, we do have a couple from Franklin Roosevelt, in part because Roosevelt was in office for so for such a very, very long time but I do try to, to space them out. And when we do the review of the chat later on, there may be some decisions that you regard as important that I have in my set of 25 that I'm not going to cover this evening. That sometimes happens as well. Decision number one comes from George Washington, and it is his decision that the people are primary, not the chief executive. We have to go back and consider exactly what it is that Washington confronted. Remember that when he became president under the Constitution, the people of the United States had never known a chief executive who was not a monarch. We were essentially a colony of Great Britain. They had a king. We fought for our freedom and we earned it. And then we made the terrible decision to adopt the Articles of Confederation. Articles of Confederation essentially said that the states are the most important governing body, not the federal government. There was no chief executive. The federal government couldn't even levy taxes. It couldn't even raise a militia. It was there in name only. So when Madison and Hamilton put together the Constitutional Convention, 
and said, in essence, we need to do this again, and created the Constitution, Washington comes in and is our very first president. He is aware that everything that he has done uh, is going to create a precedent. And one of those precedents is to be sure that everyone is reminded that he is the elected head of the government, that his period in time is limited to his term in office. He is the person who says that no man should serve more than two terms. Now, eventually that becomes, of course, an amendment to the Constitution, but he sets the standard for that. He also says that uh, although the Constitution gives me certain powers, uh, I'm going to interpret them in a very, very conservative way. Let me give you an example. Constitution says that the national legislature passes laws and the chief executive enforces the laws, but also gives the chief executive the right to veto. Washington never vetoed a piece of legislation. He said, that's not my job. My job is to enforce it. He also set a standard for how presidents should behave in terms of his cabinet and his advisors. He made sure to meet regularly with them. He made sure to listen to them and counsel with them as he did when he was a general and to build up a consensus for decisions, knowing he had the authority, but using a consensus basis. When Alexander Hamilton said to him, well, you know, we have an issue with what to call you, how about your Lord High Excellency? And Washington said, no, that, that sounds way too European. How about you call me Mr. President? Which is interesting because we still call the president, Mr. President. There was an exception, Andrew Jackson liked to be called general, but he was an exception in many ways. In any case, Washington said, no, call me Mr. President. Washington made sure that when he assigned the military to do tasks, they did what he assigned. When there was Shays Rebellion in Pennsylvania, he rode out with them, but of course he didn't wear his military uniform. He never did when he was president because he thought he should observe what's going on because it was an important event in our early history. But he did as the elected head of the government and the elected head of the military. We have never had a military coup in this country. And one of the reasons is in part because we have an elected chief executive who's in charge of the military and Washington made sure to start in that particular direction. He believed that the separation of powers was extremely important and that the constitution was set up that there were three equal branches of government. Now it's pretty clear when you read the constitution that the framers pretty much assumed that Washington would be the first president. Even so, however, he set us on the right course about how people in that office should behave. And I'm gonna consider that a decision. Many people suggested to him that he could ask to become an elected monarch. And it's possible given his popularity at the time that he could do that, but he said, absolutely not. And after eight years in office, he retired and went back to Virginia and let someone else become president. That is a good decision on his part and started us on the right path as a nation. Remember, all the nations, literally all the nations of Europe were in agreement that the experiment, which was the United States, this representative form of government, you elect your leaders, et cetera, was gonna fail, absolutely was gonna fail. And Washington and others wanted to be sure that that was not the case. And so he devoted himself to making sure that our form of government would prosper. And it did. And I give him credit for the first great decision. The second great decision is unfortunately a bad one. And this falls on the shoulders of John Adams, who was vice president under Washington, and then our second president. Adams was a great patriot. And since this is a library program, it's time to mention one of my favorite books, which is David McCullough's wonderful award-winning biography of John Adams, which if you have not read it, you should. Uh, McCullough spends more than a few pages talking about what I'm gonna talk about, which is the Alien and Sedition Act. Adams was thin-skinned. You would think that with all he had been through, uh, he would not have a thin skin, but he did. He did not like to be criticized. And when he became president and he started making decisions, particularly how we would interact with countries in Europe, et cetera, 
there were a number of people who disagreed with him, including, by the way, his vice president, Jefferson. He didn't like to be disagreed with. He didn't like to be countered in terms of what he wanted to do. And essentially, he convinced the national legislature to pass the Alien and Sedition Acts. Those acts had a number of components to them, essentially four components to the Alien and Sedition Acts. There was the Naturalization Act, which uh, established a 14-year timeline to become a citizen. There hadn't been a timeline before, so we put that in. There was the Alien Friends Act, which allowed the president to imprison and deport non-citizens who were deemed dangerous. Who deemed them dangerous? The executive branch. In other words, it's not by trial, it's by fiat from the executive branch. Third, there was the Alien Enemies Act. And that is people in this country who were from a foreign nation, they also could be imprisoned and then deported based upon a decision of the chief executive. And then finally, the Sedition Act, which criminalized making false statements that were critical of the federal government. 1798, we started under the Constitution in 1789. We were a very young country. We had passed the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments, the Constitution. And if you think about those four parts of this that I said, some of them fly in the face of the Bill of Rights. The National Congress fairly quickly came to its senses and said, wait a minute, this is, these aren't good ideas. We can't continue these, and, and these have to stop. And they either reversed or allowed to uh, come to a conclusion. Three of the four components of that, one remained in place. Uh, the Alien Enemies Act remained in place. I want you to remember the one that was not reversed because we're going to return to it later in this presentation. A uh, historian of the period, as a matter of fact, indicated that this was quite possibly the worst decision made by a president. Uh, that's debatable. We've had a lot of bad decisions. Uh, but one historian of the period uh, suggests that that was the worst decision. It also led to something which had a delayed consequence. Jefferson became very angry with Adams. James Madison became angry with Adams. Jefferson, although vice president, left the Capitol and went back to Virginia and stayed there for the rest of his term in office. And he and Madison wrote a document called the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. And in those resolutions, it essentially says that if the federal government oversteps its boundaries and makes decisions that cause harm to the citizens of a state. The state has the right to protect its citizens, including the right to secede from the union. 1798, we aren't even 10 years old yet. And we already have two of our luminaries, Jefferson and Madison, who are writing down that there are reasons for a state to secede. Later on, 1858, 1859, 1860, when states in the South are talking about secession, one of the things they point to is the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. And they say, Jefferson and Madison, certainly revered patriots, specifically said that we can secede if the federal government is overstepping its boundaries, which we believe it is. They wouldn't have written that had Adams not forced that through the Congress. The Alien and Sedition Acts were terrible legislation that should never have been passed. And luckily, three of the four parts of them no longer exist. We'll return to that fourth part in a few minutes. The third decision, we go back to the positive side again. And this is the decision by Thomas Jefferson to buy the Louisiana Purchase. The uh, Joseph Ellis, who is the principal biographer of Jefferson, Another book recommendation, his book, American Sphinx, which is a biography of Jefferson is superb. And he calls it the greatest decision any president ever made. I don't necessarily agree with that. I'll give you my opinion later on in the presentation, but it certainly was impactful. If you think of the United States, that would be the continental, not Alaska, not Hawaii, but the continental US, think of it as kind of thirds. The Eastern third includes the 13 colonies and the 
area that we were developing as of 1800. There's the middle third, which is essentially the Louisiana Purchase. And then we have the Western third, most of which we gained during the Mexican-American War. So this is going to grab the middle part of the continent. It is going to more than double the size of the United States and produce a great number of states which come out of it later on. But there's a story to it. The story goes like this. Over in Europe, Napoleon was fighting other countries, which is not surprising because Napoleon often did that. And he was draining the French treasury. So he contacts the US government, he contacts uh, Jefferson and says, would the United States be interested in purchasing the Louisiana territory from France? Napoleon's motivation, of course, is purely economic. He wants to boost up his treasury. Jefferson thinks it's interesting. So Jefferson um, puts together a group of representatives and sends them to Europe. And he gives them a budget, which is kind of surprising for Jefferson, who invariably overspent um, his personal budget. But he gives them a budget. And roughly speaking, the budget is $2 million. And he says to the group, OK, uh, negotiate as best you can, but don't exceed $2 million. Good luck. And they sail for France. They come back a few months later and they visit Jefferson. And this is how I imagine the conversation. Despite what my children and grandchildren think, I was not there for this conversation. So this is just how I imagine it. The representatives come back and they say, well, President Jefferson, we've got good news and bad news. Jefferson says, OK, what's the good news? And they say, we've purchased the Louisiana Territory. We own it. Jefferson says, great. What's the bad news? And the representatives say, we agreed to pay $14 million. Now, Jefferson's pretty good with calculations, and that's seven times more than the budget he gave them. And he says, why did you go so far over the budget? And the group says, well, we figured one of two things would happen. We would come back and say the price went up, but we were supposed to stop at $2 million, And we decided um, not to exceed our budget. And we'd come back and tell you we didn't buy it, and you'd be unhappy. Or we would come back and say to you, we kind of overspent our budget, which would be a fair statement. We kind of overspent our budget and you would persuade the national legislature to approve the additional funds. Jefferson takes a deep breath and goes to see the secretary of the treasury, a man named Albert Gallatin and says to him, Albert, what do you, th what do you think if I were to tell you that we agreed to pay $14 million for the Louisiana territory? And Gallatin throws a fit. And famously says, if we do that, the United States will be in debt forever. If you've looked at the national debt clock recently, you know that we're in debt. And as we fight the pandemic, our debt's going to get even bigger. The fact of the matter is, though, that Gallatin would end up going to Europe and negotiating with some European banks. We would take out a loan to be able to make the payment to Napoleon, which is kind of bizarre. The banks are loaning money to us to pay Napoleon so we can wage war in Europe. Bankers can't always understand them. And we would repay the loan in four years and have no debt. So we ended up fairly quickly. The interesting part of this is that Jefferson's a small government president. He believes the ideal American citizen's a farmer. He thinks we should have a tiny military and a tiny Navy. And the federal government should be as small as possible because states are where the real strength of the nation reside. And he approved putting us that far into debt. Jefferson would write about it later. And he would say, I looked at this as a once in a lifetime opportunity. And although my principles told me, don't spend that much money, I felt that if I didn't, I would be impeding the growth of the United States. And so I made the decision. In retrospect, it's, I think, rather impossible to argue with the decision that he made. We got the Louisiana Territory, more than double the size of the country. Napoleon got to go fight a bit longer with the money that we paid him. Everyone seemed to be happy. It is, in fact, a great decision. Next great decision. James Monroe and the Monroe Doctrine, 1823. First, remember that the Monroe Doctrine was not written by Monroe. It was actually written by his Secretary of State, 
John Quincy Adams, who will be the next president of the United States. John Quincy was Secretary of State at the time Murrow was president. And the issue that arose was that Europeans were staking claim, additional claims, to various places in the Western Hemisphere. Monroe and Adams thought that we were strong enough that we could make a statement, we the United States were strong enough that we could make a statement that said to Europe, you know what, this is really our sphere of influence. That, by the way, isn't a phrase that was used in 1823. It's a phrase we would use now, but that's essentially what they meant. It's our sphere of influence, and the specific Monroe Doctrine reads like this. The American continents, by free and independent condition, which they have assumed and maintained, are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. In other words, if you're already there, you're there. But if you're not there yet, you can't come. And we are going to defend that. Now, from 1823 until 1901, when Theodore Roosevelt becomes president, we aren't too terribly active in defending it. We do a few things here and there, but it's not a really big thing. But when we get into the 20th century, uh, commonly called the American century, certainly called that by Roosevelt, we start to flex our muscles a bit and now we put it into play. We use that logic when we get to building the Panama Canal, a decision I'll talk about later. We use that logic when we protect the country of Venezuela because it was insolvent, which kind of sounds like a headline from today, Venezuela is insolvent. We use it when Kennedy has the Cuban Missile Crisis. In his speech to the nation, he actually cites the Monroe Doctrine as justification for what we do in Cuba. Interestingly, we didn't ask the other nations in the Western Hemisphere whether they wanted to be protected by us. We just kind of assumed that they would be, and it would work out well for us. The Monroe Doctrine no longer exists, although if you look real hard on YouTube, you can find John Bolton uh, making a quote during his brief tenure as National Security Advisor, that uh, the Monroe Doctrine is alive and well. Well, it's not. And it actually makes no sense anymore because of the relationship that we have with other nations in the Western Hemisphere. But for a while, it certainly was a guidepost for our foreign policy, particularly when we get to Theodore Roosevelt and through a good part of the 20th century, James Monroe and the Monroe Doctrine. Next decision, a bad one. And this is Andrew Jackson and the Trail of Tears. Historian Robert Remini says, and I find this entertaining, that Jackson is the sort of president that the United States can only tolerate about once every hundred years. To call him disruptive would be an understatement. He did do some good things while he was president. He fought the National Bank which was a profit-making pit for wealthy people that didn't help the currency. Unfortunately, the way he did it caused a panic of 1837 as a subject for a different lecture, but he did do some good things. But the Indian Removal Act, not so much. What he did here was uh, he supported the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which caused the removal of 16,000 Native Americans from Florida, Georgia, Alabama, North and South Carolina to Oklahoma Territory, because we all know that Oklahoma looks a whole lot like Florida, Georgia, Alabama, and the Carolinas. Why was this even an issue? Well, I'm going to answer that, but you need to remember that uh, Jackson, among his other shortcomings, was a flaming racist. He believed that if you were not Caucasian, you simply were not the equal of people who were. That extends to Blacks. It also extends to Native Americans. Your skin's a bit brown. You just aren't equal. And he believed that deeply. So he's president. And those states that I mentioned look inside their states. And what they see are Indian reservations established by the federal government on a reasonable basis to allow Native Americans to stay in the land which they'd been in for generations and to not have to move. It made them essentially uh, separate nations inside of the United States. 
and that they were to be left alone. So far, so good. Except developers, who all happen to be Caucasian, developers said, well, look at that land. Wow, we could do a lot more with that land than those Native Americans are doing. Uh, we could build cities, we could build railroads, we could do a number of things, but we can't touch it. So the Indian Removal Act allowed the federal government to say to those Native Americans, um, we're going to give you the same amount of land that you have now, it's just going to be in a different part of the country, and you're going to have to move. You've got a couple of years to get ready for this, and then you're going to have to move. That is, in essence, the Indian Removal Act. As soon as they would leave the native lands, then they would become owned by the states that they were within who could gain economic profit from owning or selling or developing that particular land. Well, the Native Americans didn't want to move. They'd been there for generations. Uh, they believed the spirits of ancestors were there, and they didn't want to move. Some fought the U.S. Army, and that didn't work out so well because the U.S. Army was too strong for them. And then there was one group that said, you know, here's something we can do. How about if we bring a lawsuit in the federal courts and say that President uh, Jackson's actions are unconstitutional? Well, they couldn't do it themselves because they're separate nations, but they found a way to have a representative represent them and bring the suit on their behalf. The federal court system said, okay, and the suit made it all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court made a decision about whether or not what Jackson did was constitutional. Uh, our chief justice at the time was John Marshall, who many people regard as our greatest chief justice. And Marshall writes a majority opinion, which says to Jackson, what you did to the Native Americans is unconstitutional. It broke the treaty, essentially. It's unconstitutional. You've got to bring them back from wherever you put them, mostly Oklahoma. You have to give them their land back and you have to pay them reparations. Jackson's response to this is not recorded, but knowing how Jackson spoke, uh, it is probably likely that he said something like, so how many divisions does the chief justice have? The answer of course is none, he's in the judiciary. And Jackson refused to follow the orders of the Supreme Court. There are a few times in our history where presidents did not follow a decision from the Supreme Court or inside of our constitution. Even Abraham Lincoln, who I regard as our greatest president, at one point uh, did not follow habeas corpus during the Civil War. So occasionally it happens. We are lucky though that we've not had a president who made a habit of disagreeing with the Supreme Court and not following what they said. So although the Native Americans weren't allowed to come back, that was the only time that Jackson acted that far afield of his constitutional duty. And the Native Americans were in Oklahoma and the Trail of Tears has to do with the number of them that died while they were in transit, walking from those states in the southeastern corner of the US out to Oklahoma. There is an interesting dramatic event that happens while the Congress is debating the Indian Removal Act, the final vote in favor of it in the House of Representatives was paper thin. And a representative uh, from Kentucky uh, stood up on the floor of the House of Representatives and said that this was the worst bill that uh, the legislature had ever discussed. There may have been other ones that were worse too, but whatever. The worst bill we've ever discussed and absolutely should be voted down because it does not honor the Native Americans who were in this country before us. That representative was Davy Crockett. Now Crockett and his grouping lost the vote narrowly, but it made Jackson very angry to have Crockett oppose him. So Jackson made sure to develop a campaign fund and to slot someone to run against Crockett when the next vote came up for the House of Representatives and Crockett lost. He didn't return to Congress, which is one reason why a few years later, uh, he would be available to go try to help Texas defend its honor and fight against Mexico for their freedom. In any case, that decision ranks as one of the worst. We had treaties with the Native Americans. We didn't compensate them. 
We said, you have so many acres there, you'll have so many acres there. Same thing, not a good decision. We go forward to Abraham Lincoln and his decision to fight the Civil War. Now, I need to explain exactly why I regard that as a great decision. The Civil War cost 650,000 American lives. That is the worst total, actually that total is worse than all of our other wars put together. It is an awful, awful amount. But it does get the phrase uh, slavery or involuntary servitude out of the constitution, and that's not so bad. And Lincoln didn't have to fight the Civil War. He chose to. Let's go back a bit. In the election of 1860, there are four major candidates running for president. Lincoln, of course, Douglas running as a Democrat, he's also from Illinois, and two parties that come out of the South. Lincoln campaigns on the basis of, I am personally against slavery, but if elected president, I will enforce the constitution which allows slavery, and we will not allow states to secede. Keep in mind that Southern states are talking about seceding uh, as early as 1857. Keep in mind that when Lincoln gives his first inaugural speech, seven of the 11 states in the Confederacy have already seceded and this Confederacy's already elected its own president, Jefferson Davis. That's already happened by then. But in the election of November of 1860, Lincoln only gets 40% of the popular vote. He manages to just squeak by in the electoral college, so he's elected, but 40%, which means 60% of Americans who voted, voted against someone other than Lincoln and someone who either supported or was willing to tolerate the South seceding. Lincoln gets into office. He faces a divided country. He faces a divided legislature. The Democrats, who were called Peace Democrats also at the time, have a significant chunk of the legislature. And in 1862 midterms, they're going to increase. They'll still be a minority, but they're going to increase the number of seats that they have. Lincoln could have said to the nation, we're going to let the South go. The Democrats would have supported him. The people uh, in the North, uh, the conservative Republicans, if you will, would probably have gone along with it. He probably could have convinced the Congress to let that happen. But his interpretation as a lawyer was that the oath of office said he had to defend and protect the Constitution. And his interpretation of that meant that states could not secede. Therefore, we had to fight the war. The first two years of the Civil War were fought because the South wanted to secede and the North said, no, you can't. That's why hundreds of thousands of young men in the North volunteered to fight to keep the Union together. Although the fact is that the Civil War was always about slavery from a historical perspective, the Civil War doesn't really officially become about slavery until January 1st, 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect. But that's nearly two years after the war got started. We fought that war for nearly two years to determine whether we could keep the Union together or let it fall apart. And Lincoln chose to fight. It's always dangerous to go into historical speculation that what if, what if, what if logic. But this one is interesting. What if Lincoln had let the South go? What would have happened? Well, we wouldn't have had 650,000 people die. That's true. But in the North, which includes where you and I are today, in the North, we would have been fine. We had industry, we had wealth, we had a financial system, we had a significant population, and we would have become a thriving country doing you know, westward expansion and, and heading in that direction and making those places states. The South would have become a third world nation. They had no financial system. They had almost no manufacturing. They were dependent upon two products, cotton and tobacco, and they had slaves. How long would they have retained slavery? We actually have a data point for reference. The last country in the Western hemisphere to outlaw slavery was Brazil. 
in 1910. That would have been a number of years after the end of the Civil War. There is no reason to expect that the South, given its attitude towards Blacks, would have ended slavery any sooner than that. So how many million people would have been subjected to slavery beyond the number that already had been? Hard to speculate, but the number, I'm afraid, is depressingly large. And Lincoln stopped that by saying, we are going to fight the Civil War, which we did. I regard it as the correct decision, by the way, even though it did lead to 650,000 deaths, it was the right decision. States who agreed to join the Union, that compact is forever. And that's what we have now. From Lincoln, we're going to skip into the 20th century. And we are going to meet Theodore Roosevelt. And we are going to meet the interesting story of the Panama Canal. Theodore Roosevelt, who is always ranked as one of our top five presidents, was a pure imperialist and proud of it. An imperialist, uh, given the definition at the time, would be, uh, if it's good for the United States, it's good for the rest of the world. The 20th century is going to be the American century, a phrase that Roosevelt often used. And we need to exert ourselves on the world stage. And we did in a variety of ways. Roosevelt's president for three and a half years, finishing off the term of William McKinley. Oh, by the way, I just finished a wonderful book about McKinley written by Karl Rove about why the election of 1896 still matters, which is when McKinley defeated William Jennings Bryan the first time. It's a fascinating book. And I would suggest if you are uh, interested in, in the nuts and bolts of politics and presidential campaigns, you probably would enjoy that book. Anyway, McKinley's assassinated six months into his second term and Roosevelt becomes president then runs on his own. So he is president for about seven and a half years until he's succeeded by Taft. And during that seven and a half years, he makes a major impact on the world in a variety of ways. We are just going to talk about, however, the Panama Canal. It had been recognized as early as 1870 that that strip called the Isthmus of Panama uh, would be a wonderful place to go across to connect the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans for trade in particular. The United States actually gets the uh, contract to build a railroad across the Isthmus of Panama, which we do. The railroad can, can move cargo and people back and forth, of course, in very limited quantities. The canal would be better. So as early as 1880, the French, under a man named Ferdinand de Lesseps, uh, try to build a canal. De Lesseps, whose name you may recognize, was the person who was the chief financier behind the building of the Suez Canal. Well, Lesseps thought that he could also do that across Panama. It turns out Panama is, is much more formidable than going through Egypt because of the weather, because of the pestilence, because of the mountain ranges, et cetera. And the French, after a few years, go essentially bankrupt on the project, and the French give it up. Roosevelt becomes president and wants to build a canal, in part because he sees the advantage for the US Navy. And Roosevelt was always a supporter of the US Navy. The United States can't quite make up its mind between Nicaragua and uh, going through the Isthmus of Panama, which is owned, by the way, by Colombia. It's not a country yet. Uh, the route through the Isthmus was shorter, but the route through Nicaragua would be flatter and easier. But Nicaragua had a problem with volcanoes, and they started erupting as the U.S. was making its decision. It was decided that Panama would be a better place to try to build it because you wouldn't have volcanoes spewing all over you. So Roosevelt sends his Secretary of State, John Hay, down to meet with and negotiate with the Colombian government. You may recognize the name of John Hay. He was one of Abraham Lincoln's two private secretaries. And it's because of Hay and John Nikolai, Lincoln's other private secretary, that we have so much of Lincoln's letters and paperwork. When Lincoln was assassinated, those two young men at the time scooped up Lincoln's stuff and protected it and preserved it. So now when you go to the Lincoln Museum in Springfield or you go to visit Washington DC, you can see so much Lincoln stuff. Anyway, 
Hay is Secretary of State. Hay goes down at Roosevelt's request, meets with the Colombians, discusses what they want to do. Colombia says, okay, uh, we will sell the rights to you and you can build the canal and you can manage it and you pay us royalties and everything sounds fine. Uh, here's how much you have to pay us. Hay says, fine. Goes back, meets with Roosevelt and explains the deal. Roosevelt says, okay. Talks to Congress. Congress says, okay, we can improve that amount of money. Hay goes back to negotiate with the Colombians and sign the contract. The Colombians say to Hay, while you were gone, the price went up. Hay says, that's not really a good idea, increasing the price, because when I go back and tell President Roosevelt, he's not going to be real happy about that. And you may want to consider not making President Roosevelt angry. Well, the Colombians didn't really think about that terribly much, and they said, well, that's the price. It goes okay. But before Hay can get back to and leave the area of Colombia, he meets a man named Philippe Bunau Varia. I'm just going to call him Philippe because that's easier to pronounce. And Philippe's a member of the government in Colombia, and he says, um, I have an offer for you that might be attractive. There are a number of us that believe that the Colombian government's being unfair, and we are willing to go to the Isthmus of Panama, stage a revolution, create an independent nation of Panama, and sign over the rights to you. We'll be happy to do it. He says, really, what do you need? And Philippe says, very surprisingly, well, money would be one thing we would need. And he specifies a certain amount. And we also need some protection from the US military because it's likely the Colombian government is not gonna take this too kindly. He goes back to the US, explains the situation to Roosevelt. Roosevelt probably said bully because Roosevelt said that a lot. And the agreement is struck. Uh, Philippe and his friends go to Panama, the Isthmus of Panama, talk to some people who are there, buy off a couple of people, and there's a revolution, a one-day revolution. No one's even killed, for goodness sake. One-day revolution. And they declare the sovereign nation of Panama. Long live Theodore Roosevelt, says their first official proclamation, which is kind of weird for a new country to say that, but they did. And you can understand why. Sure enough, people, the government of Colombia is not happy with this, and they send an army. Uh, but Philippe intercepts the army and says, you know, before you attack us, you may want to look out in the harbor there because those are U.S. gunboats and those are U.S. Marines on the gunboats. And if you attack us, they're going to attack you and probably not going to be good for you. The general of the Colombian forces considers the situation and goes, you're right. Turns around and marches back to Colombia and we have created the country of Panama so that we could build the canal. Now, there's no argument that we had the engineering capability to build it. We had the mechanical aptitude to build it, and we certainly had the desire to build it. No argument about any of that. But think of imperialism. We created a country so that we could get approval to build the canal. I always found that particularly impressive. Let's move forward to Franklin Roosevelt. We're going to spend a few minutes with Franklin Roosevelt. We're going to talk about a good decision. We're going to talk about two bad decisions. Let's do the good one first. The good Franklin Roosevelt decision was what he did during the first 100 days of his first administration. Let me read just a couple of sentences from his first inaugural speech. You'll recognize the end of it. I am certain that, by, that my fellow Americans expect that on my induction into the presidency, I will address them with a candor and a decision which the present situation of our nation impels. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Well, that speech proves three things. One, Roosevelt's a great speech maker. Two, Roosevelt was not much of an economist because just us not being fearful was not going to reverse the Great Depression. Three, the 17 major pieces of legislation that he introduces during the first 100 days, all of which passed Congress on a bipartisan basis, 
You remember what bipartisan is, I assume. Maybe we'll even see it again, who can tell. On a bipartisan basis, change forever the relationship between the federal government and the US economy. Let's do a contrast with Herbert Hoover, who was the president who preceded Roosevelt. Hoover believed that the laws and rules governing the presidency did not allow him to get involved in the economy. Roosevelt comes into office and says, well, I'm looking at the constitution. It doesn't say I can't, so I'm going to assume that I can. This, by the way, leads to the highlight of tonight's presentation. This is my Herbert Hoover impersonation. It only goes for about 10 seconds. It does make a point. And this is Herbert Hoover's economic speech to the nation, because he was getting asked a lot, 1930, 1931. What are you going to do to get us out of the depression? Here's Hoover's answer. Now pay attention. This is really technical. The economy goes up. The economy goes down. Right now, the US economy is down. But if we wait long enough, it'll go back up. I hope you followed that. Assuming you did, Hoover to a degree was correct based on economic cycles. Sure enough, if we had done nothing, eventually we would have worked our way out of the Great Depression, maybe in 1939. But we had 25% unemployment. Our GDP had dropped 50%. We had bread lines. We had people who couldn't afford to pay their rent or their mortgages. America was in crisis. And not only that, the people who were being affected were starting to think about maybe this democratic system we're using isn't so good. People over in Europe are talking about socialism. People in Russia are talking about communism, and that's a worker's paradise over there. And maybe we should think about changing the way we govern ourselves. Well, that's not a good decision. So here comes Roosevelt, who says, in the midst of a Great Depression, the federal government has to jump in with both feet, has to spend money, do deficit spending, and get people to work through money which is invested by the federal government. By the way, this is not based on John Maynard Keynes. Keynes doesn't write his classical analysis of world economies until 1936. This came out of Roosevelt and his brain trust, where they said we have to spend money at the federal level, prime the pump, jumpstart the economy, pick your phrase, but we have to do it. But we have to do it in a way that we put people to work. That's the key. When Hoover spent some money, and he did, he built some infrastructure projects, including a dam, which now has his name, his belief was, well, we can spend money, but we've got to increase taxes so that the federal budget stays balanced and doesn't go into deficit. Well, if you're having a depression, that is not the time to try to have a balanced budget, assuming you want the economy to recover. So the 17 major pieces of legislation include the Emergency Banking Relief Act to stop banks from failing, the Civilian Conservation Corps, which I personally regard as the best piece of legislation that came out of that, putting hundreds of thousands of young men to work. And when they were paid every month, three fourths of their salary had to go back home to their wives or mothers or families back home. The Federal Emergency Relief Act, the Emergency Farm Mortgage Act to stop farmers from being foreclosed on and losing their farms. The Tennessee Valley Authority, which not only brought electricity to major portions of our country that didn't have any, it put a lot of people to work building those dams that created the hydroelectric power. The National Industrial Recovery Act, the Glass-Steagall Glass Banking Act, even though some of these would later be determined to be unconstitutional, the fact is it created momentum. And men who were doing most of the work at the time, men were working and were getting paid. So it wasn't the dole, it wasn't the handout. They were working for the money the federal government was paying them. The work of the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Works Projects Administration was superb in terms of national infrastructure in the first 100 days, which is why you hear the phrase for every new administration, and you've seen it in the news since Biden was inaugurated, what's it gonna do in the first 100 days? That phrase was started when Roosevelt had his first term in office because he did so much in the first 100 days. He planned it, 
he organized it, he led it, and he made it happen. It changed forever. You and I may have a discussion about is the federal government too big or too small, but we are not going to disagree that the federal government has a role in the national economy, and that we would agree on because of what Franklin Roosevelt did. Let's go to two of Roosevelt's bad decisions. The first was court packing, or what we sometimes call nine old men. In Roosevelt's second term, the Supreme Court was starting to find some of his legislation from the New Deal unconstitutional. The logic was that too much authority was being vested in the executive branch of the government. And some of these programs should be controlled out of the legislature as opposed to being directed by the executive branch. We're gonna have a short time out now where I take a drink of ginger ale, thank you. Okay, now I can talk for a few more minutes. And that bothered Roosevelt a lot because he thought that if the Supreme Court started to determine things were unconstitutional, some of his signature programs were going to be dismantled. So he looked at the votes of the court and came to the following idea. If he had the ability to appoint to the Supreme Court one judge for every sitting judge who was 65 years or older, he could change the balance of the Supreme Court. Now notice, I use the word appoint, not nominate. The current rules, and we've seen that three times during the Trump administration, was that the president nominates and then the Senate confirms. Roosevelt wanted to jump over that confirmation part and just say, I want to appoint people to the Supreme Court. Presumably he would appoint people that agreed with his point of view. They would go on to the court, and based upon the composition of the court at the time and the age of the justices, he would have approximately a two to one advantage on the court of justices who looked at the world in the way that he did. That is a constitutional crisis. The separation of powers and the federal government is incredibly important to the way we govern ourselves, and that would have changed the way of that separation of powers and given the executive branch way too much authority. Roosevelt's vice president, Jack Garner from Texas, walks into Roosevelt's office and says, you are wrong. This is a terrible idea. And I am going to go and talk with my friends in the Senate. Uh, Garner had been a Senator from Texas for a long time. And we are going to defeat you. You do not have the votes. Sure enough, when it gets to the point where this is actually being discussed in the Senate, it is clear that Roosevelt does not have enough votes. And in fact, his idea is voted down. Roosevelt becomes angry at Garner. And when Roosevelt runs for a third term in 1940, he kicks Garner off the ticket and he uh, goes with Henry Wallace as his vice president. By the way, after four years of Henry Wallace, he gets tired of Wallace also. Wallace was a bit too progressive for Roosevelt's taste. So he, he kicks Wallace off the ticket and says the Democratic Party, just pick somebody because I'm going to run for a fourth term when we need a vice president. That leads to the selection of Harry Truman, interestingly. In any case, Jack Garner gets some credit, and he doesn't get a lot, for opposing and fighting Roosevelt on the court packing scheme changing the composition of the court to try to line it up with your political ideology is dangerous. And the reason it's dangerous is there's no stopping example, whether or not you like the composition of the court at the moment. You have Democratic president, Democratic legislature. We add some people to the Supreme Court. We go to 11 justices. We appoint some liberal justices. The next president is Republican. They have control of the legislature, goes up to 13 justices. Where exactly does it stop? How do you stop? So I hope that we stay with nine. I hope we do not follow court packing. And right in case, Roosevelt was not allowed to because the Senate told him he couldn't. 
Now we get to a bad decision, which is the equivalent of different time and place, but the equivalent of Jackson's decision about the Trail of Tears. And that is executive order number 9066, putting 112,000 Japanese American citizens into internment camps for the rest of the war, taking them from their homes, taking them from their businesses, many of which were lost, by the way, uh, putting them in internment camps and keeping them under armed guard for the rest of the war. What Roosevelt did was legal. How was he able to do that? Remember I said there was that one part of the Alien and Sedition Act that the Congress didn't cancel? Using that part of the act, what Roosevelt did was legal. It was simply morally reprehensible. These are Japanese Americans. These are American citizens, and they were deprived of their rights. Why in the world did we do that? Combination of racism and fear. Japanese don't look like I do. They have a different skin color. Their eyes look somewhat different than mine, and we were at war with them. And the rumor along the West Coast was that the Japanese, having attacked Pearl Harbor, were now going to launch an invasion somewhere on the West Coast. In truth, the Japanese had no plans to ever invade United States mainland. They sent over a few bombs on balloons and some of that stuff, but they never had any plans to. They assumed that after Pearl Harbor, the United States would pull back to its continental boundaries and give Japan kind of freedom of motion inside the Pacific Ocean. Our response turned out to be very different than that. That being the case, the people on the West Coast were afraid. I understand that. And they looked at Japanese Americans as you look a whole lot like those people that attacked us at Pearl Harbor. And that led to passing that executive order. The governor of California flew to Washington DC and testified in support of this saying, it's a great idea. You can't trust those Japanese Americans. His name was Earl Warren, who was governor of California at the time. Warren would later counteract some of the bad image from this by being the chief justice when we do the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954. But at the time, he uh, was fully in support of putting those Japanese Americans in internment camps. Now, we're going to get to a, I'm gonna make a couple of statements now, which some people disagree with. And I wanna, since you can't really disagree with me in a, web, in a webinar, let me explain this real carefully. Executive order number 9066 talks about Japanese Americans and puts them in internment camps. We did not create internment camps for German Americans. We did not create internment camps for Italian Americans. They kind of look like us. During the war, we did arrest German nationals and Italian nationals. We put them in jail for a while and we deported them. We also followed some German Americans and Italian Americans that we were suspicious of. We put them in jail for a while. Some of them were deported, but Executive Order 9066 targets Japanese Americans only. Now, during World War II, the, uh, during World War II, there were 10 people in the United States who were accused of spying on the US government on behalf of the empire of Japan. 10 were accused, 10 were brought to trial, 10 were convicted, and 10 were executed. None of them were Japanese Americans. They were all Caucasians who had been paid by the empire of Japan to spy on us. In other words, there wasn't a single case of a Japanese American convicted of spying against our country. Even more amazing than that, at least more amazing to me, is that young men came out of these camps and volunteered to fight for the United States in Europe and formed the most highly decorated unit that fought in Europe during World War II with their families in internment camps. They fought for the United States. Sure, you recall Senator Daniel in a way from Hawaii and the fact that he always had one sleeve on his suit coat pinned because he didn't really have an arm under that coat. He was one of those young men who fought on behalf of the United States. 
it's really a stretch for me to say, okay, I'm going to go fight for this country while my family is under lock and key because you don't trust them, but you trust me to go fight in Europe. Interesting decision that they made. I regard that decision as reprehensible. Let's go to Harry Truman, my second favorite president, by the way, my favorite is Abraham Lincoln. Let's go to Truman, my second favorite. We've got two positive decisions that Truman does. By the way, Truman did make some negative decisions, but we don't cover them in the presentation. The first is Truman and dropping the atomic bomb on Japan, two of them, and I'm going to call that a positive decision. Let me explain. When you evaluate presidential decisions, you have to look at them based upon the information that the decision maker had at the time they made the decision. It is unfair historically to say, aha, we know more now than you knew then. And based upon what we know now, you made the wrong decision. That is unfair. We have to go back to 1945 and what Truman knew. Now I do a presentation on this, it goes on for an hour because it turns out that Truman really went through a lot of mental gymnastics trying to figure out what to do. He's being influenced by various people, including the military who really want to use the bomb. It's actually an interesting and complex story. But let me jump to the issue of what Truman knew. Truman had essentially two pieces of information. The first piece of information given to him by the US military was, if we drop the two bombs on Japan, on the cities that had been targeted, we estimated that maybe 100,000 Japanese would die. Turns out the number is much higher. Turns out the bombs were stronger than we thought. Turns out there was more damage as well as the radiation poisoning, which killed a lot of people in the following few weeks. We aren't even talking about the effect on DNA in future generations. So let's bump that number up to 200,000. But what Truman was told was 100,000. On the other side, Truman is looking at a land invasion of Japan. It was going to be led by Douglas MacArthur. And the estimates that the military had given him was, if we invaded Japan by ourselves, we didn't let Russia help because Russia was asking us if they could help. We didn't let Great Britain or Australia help, we did it ourselves. We would suffer about 1 million casualties. That's dead, wounded, missing casualties. And the number of Japanese who would die was at least 4 million. So that's 5 million over here, and that's 100,000 over here. So in the awful calculus of war, which is less worse? 100,000, drop the bombs. And we did. We now know that actually all we had to do was stop and do nothing for about four weeks. Japan was out of petroleum. They were out of food. They had no military left. They were discussing how they could end the war with honor, how they could surrender, and then the two drums, bombs dropped. If we'd stopped and done nothing, the war would have ended. But Truman did not know that. Based on what Truman knew, those were the two numbers. And he chose the smaller number. Personal note. In May of 1945, at Paris Island, South Carolina, two young Marines, um, my dad and my mom, who were both in the Marines in World War II, got married in a military ceremony. In Paris Island, in May of 1945, dad had fought in the Pacific for a couple of years and had come back stateside. Mom was a lady Marine and she was assigned as a truck driver, which she was always very proud of, and they got married. That was in May. We dropped the bombs in August. When they got married, dad already had his orders to prepare to go back to the Pacific because he was going to be in the invasion force, as did hundreds of thousands of other young men in similar situations had the orders as well. So when I got old enough that I could actually discuss these things with my folks, they always said, uh, Truman saved dad from having to go back to fight. Well, in a sense, he did, but Truman saved a whole lot of people from both sides by making the decision that he did. The second Truman decision is an actual constitutional crisis. And that is the removal of Douglas MacArthur from command in Korea. 
This is an interesting story, and it's time for another book recommendation. We're going back to David McCullough again and his wonderful history of Harry Truman, also an award-winning book. McCullough spends about 40 pages on what I'm going to cover in about four minutes. I'm going to condense the story just a little bit. And what MacArthur did was to confront the civilian control of the military, something that was important to George Washington and important to the framers of the Constitution. But MacArthur is going to challenge it. It has to do with the Korean War. Korean War starts off not so good. MacArthur is put in charge of a UN police action. By the way, the US supplied 85% of the troops. It's the Korean War. MacArthur is in charge. He does a great job. Push those North Koreans back up the Korean Peninsula. Mao Zedong says, I'm concerned about this. Let's let some of the Chinese infantry come in. They come in and now they're pushing our forces back towards the middle of the country. MacArthur says, well, you know, if we use atomic weapons, we can make some real headway here. And he meets with Truman at Wake Island to discuss his marvelous idea of using atomic weapons to shorten the, uh, the conflict. He says, to Truman, we're going to have to fight the communists sometime. Might as well fight them now. We've got a lot of troops here. We got those atomic weapons, weapons and let's put them to use. And Truman does two things. He tells MacArthur two things. First, he says, we're not going to use atomic weapons. I already did that to end World War II. My conscience will not allow me to use them again. We're not going to use them. Number two, unbeknownst to you, General MacArthur, we are in negotiations with the North Koreans for an armistice, a cessation of fighting so that we can work on a peace. Truman will not get credit for this, by the way, because it's going to be Eisenhower who goes to Korea, as a campaign pledge he made, will go to Korea and will bring about the armistice. But it started under Truman. Truman tells us MacArthur, and MacArthur explodes and goes, that's a terrible decision. We, we need to beat them right now. And Truman says, that's my decision. That's what we're going to do. So far, so good. Then MacArthur makes his critical mistake, and he writes a letter to the Speaker of the House of Representatives and has the Speaker read the letter to the House of Representatives. And then the letter, it says, short form, it says, the president's policy in Korea is wrong. We are going to lose Korea if we follow his policy. The commander in charge of the troops in the field, that would be MacArthur, needs to have the authority to use the proper weaponry to win this battle. And I need you to give me the authority to do that. Well, based upon the way our constitution is constructed, that is a direct affront to the constitution and the control by the elected executive branch of the military. And now Truman is facing a constitutional crisis. As soon as MacArthur does that, Truman already knows that he has to remove him. Truman, who wrote extensively in his diaries uh, after he became president, we know this because the diaries are now public record. And he writes that uh, MacArthur has grown too big for his britches and is going to have to be removed. But Truman hesitates. It's not because he didn't know what the decision should be, but he was concerned that MacArthur might come back from Korea, come to Washington, D.C., and confront him for control of this decision. MacArthur hadn't been in the US since 1936, by the way, but he was regarded as a hero. He was regarded almost in the same stature as Eisenhower. History now has separated what their contributions were, but at the time, MacArthur was pretty much regarded as a hero. And Truman was afraid that MacArthur would have a lot of support challenging Truman, whose support rating at this point was somewhere in the 18% range. Truman was not terribly popular for reasons which are not part of this presentation. But Truman turns to a trusted advisor named George Marshall, or the same Marshall whose name is attached to the Marshall Plan, and asks Marshall what he thinks of the situation. And Marshall gives Truman some good advice. Marshall says to Truman, MacArthur is a lifelong military man. He believes in the chain of command. He has never disagreed with a direct order. You are his commander. If you issue him a direct order to give up control of those troops, he will because it's a direct order from his commander. Now, 
He'll come back to the US and many people will pay attention to him. He'll probably speak to the Congress, but he will be out of a position of power and we can go on and prosecute the war. And so Truman does, sends him a direct order and MacArthur says, yes, sir, resigns his commission of being in charge of the army and comes back to the US. And true enough, as Marshall had said, uh, he's given a ticker tape parade in New York City. Uh, he goes to Washington at the invitation of the Congress and gives a speech to a joint session of the Congress where he is interrupted with standing ovations multiple times. It's the famous speech where he says near the end, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. When he leaves Washington, D.C., he believes he's extremely popular. He starts a kind of a whistle-stop tour around the U.S., thinking in the back of his head that maybe he could uh, generate enough interest to run for president. But as he goes through the country, the crowds that come out to see him get smaller and smaller and smaller because the American people at this point just want the Korean War to end. MacArthur is not in a position to do that. Truman is. So they put the pressure on Truman. And when Eisenhower runs in 52 and says, I will go to Korea, people believe him, he's elected, and the Korean War comes to a armistice. Truman did the right thing. MacArthur overstepped his bounds. And it's a shame because MacArthur had just finished four years being the military governor of Japan, where he did wonderful things, helping that country rebuild. And he tarnishes his reputation, sadly, by that decision because he was angry that Truman wouldn't let him use atomic weapons and was negotiating with the North Koreans. We have three more decisions to go. We are, so this is the second to the last decision. And this is the decision of John Kennedy to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. When did Kennedy make this speech about this? May 25th of 1961. And why did he make this speech? Now in May of 1961, remember, he was elected in 1960, he was sworn in in January, he'd only been president for four months. We hadn't reached yet, we already had the Bay of Pigs, we didn't reach the Cuban Missile Crisis yet. But there was a perception when Kennedy was running that there was a missile gap, that the United States was way behind the Soviet Union in the development of long range missiles and space technology. We now know, by the way, that we were actually ahead of the Russians in terms of a number of components of getting to space, but that was the belief. And Kennedy wanted to uh, focus the nation on reversing that. And so he goes down to Texas and he makes a speech. And in that speech, he pledges us to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And he uses some real interesting words when he makes the speech. I wanna just read a couple of the sentences he uses. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before the decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long range exploration of space and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. We propose to accelerate the development of the appropriate lunar spacecraft. In a very real sense, it will not be one man going to the moon, it will be an entire nation going to the moon and we're going to do that not because it's easy, but because it is hard. When Kennedy gives that speech in May of 61, the United States has nothing that it will need to put a man on the moon. It doesn't have the appropriate space capsules. It doesn't have the appropriate support for astronauts. It doesn't have the computer systems. It doesn't have rockets capable of getting someone to the moon, much less bringing someone back. We have not developed a lunar rover. It goes on and on. We had nothing that we needed to make that happen. The Congress agreed and funded NASA like they'd never funded it before. And American technology and scientific knowledge went to work solving the problem of getting a man to and back from the moon, which we do in 1969. And as a byproduct of that, we develop technologies that serve both industry and the military, and we did it to be able to honor Kennedy's promise. One of the signs of presidential leadership 
is the ability to articulate a vision of where a president wants the nation to go and why. And Kennedy did that perfectly when he explained why he wanted to put an American on the moon and bring him back. The nation saw the vision, they agreed with it, the Congress agreed with it, and the money was approved. And we did it. Kennedy wasn't here to see it, but as a nation, we accomplished it. And I consider that to be a great decision on Kennedy's part. The next to the last great decision comes from Lyndon Johnson. And it has to do with the social legislation that he passed with, the, asked the Congress to pass in 1964 and 1965. Lyndon Johnson, by the way, is a very difficult president to talk about because he is two people. There is domestic Johnson, that's over here, and there's international Johnson, that's over here. Domestic Johnson, if we just judge him based upon domestic issues and policies, ranks as one of our three greatest presidents. If we look at Johnson based upon his decisions regarding Vietnam, increasing troop strength, lying to the American people, refusing to accept that the war, the way he wanted to fought it could be won, he is one of our worst presidents, which is why, by the way, the C-SPAN ranking of presidents put Johnson somewhere in the middle because they averaged those two. It's very difficult to talk about because he was really good here and really bad over here. We're talking about the good part. Johnson becomes president at Kennedy's assassination. Johnson is smart enough as a politician to know that the nation is literally in mourning and will be in mourning for a couple of years. We had a martyred, young, handsome president. The nation's in mourning. Johnson is smart enough to know that if he says, this is a program that John Kennedy wanted, and to honor Kennedy's memory, we need to pass this because John Kennedy would have wanted it. There weren't many people in America that were going to argue with that logic. And Johnson used it over and over as president. And as a result, the flurry of legislation that he got through was the greatest in a short period of time since Franklin Roosevelt. By the way, Lyndon Johnson went to Washington, D.C. in 1936 as a representative from Texas, which was at the start of Roosevelt's second term. And in the White House, Johnson always kept, when he was there, always kept a big picture of Franklin Roosevelt on a central place in the White House, because that was his presidential idol. And he wanted to pass as much domestic legislation as Roosevelt did. He didn't quite reach there. But let me give you a small list of the things that he passes. Of course, there's Medicare. There's Medicaid. There's the 1964 Civil Rights Act the Federal Aid to Mass Transit Act, the anti-poverty bills, food stamps were started, the Job Corps was started, significant environmental protection legislation was passed, the creation of the Housing and Urban Development, the Voting Rights Act. Johnson is there for all of them. He drives them through the Congress, in part because so many people in Congress know him and he was a pretty good uh, negotiator. So he gets all this through Congress, the greatest wave of legislation in a short period of time since FDR. You may disagree or agree with the economic impact of some of those programs, but it's a great decision in terms of, again, America, I believe, certainly in the short term, benefited from these things being available. Anyone want to give up Medicare? Probably not. That comes from Johnson. One quick anecdote, and I've got enough time, I'm watching the clock. One quick anecdote. The first president to talk about national health care for the elderly, Medicare, was Harry Truman. He was first president to talk about it. Uh, he wasn't able to get it introduced to Congress, but he talked about it, wrote about it, that it's something we need to do. So when Johnson <clears throat> signs the legislation to create Medicare, he goes out to Independence, Missouri and sits down with Harry and with Beth, Bess rather, and uh, signs it in their presence and then gives them Medicare card number one and Medicare card number two, which go to Harry Truman and his wife because he was the first person to advocate for what became Medicare. 
And now the final decision that we cover tonight. Richard Nixon. Nixon, by the way, in my 25 decision version of this gets credit for two decisions. One is a good one. And that has to do with he and Henry Kissinger deciding to open up China in the way they did it. That's a really good decision. But the one we're gonna talk about tonight is the bad one. And this has to do with Watergate. The thing about Watergate that still surprises me is why Nixon bothered to do it. If you go back to 1972, Nixon has completed his first term in office. He is very, very popular. It is perceived that he's making progress in the Vietnam War and working for peace, that's debatable, but it's perceived that he is. He has brought a degree of law and order to the American streets that perhaps weren't quite at the same level under Johnson. And his presidency is looking pretty good. It is expected in 1972 that it's likely he'll be reelected. And then the Democrats go and nominate George McGovern, who had no chance at all of defeating Nixon. So here we go into the election of 1972, and Nixon is going to win. There is no question that Nixon is going to win. But Nixon is Nixon. It's kind of hard Nixon not being Nixon, so I guess that's not surprising. And Nixon is paranoid. By the way, one could argue that Nixon wasn't paranoid because people were out to get him, but we're not going to go into that speculation. So Nixon is paranoid, and Nixon believes that he wants to absolutely be sure that he wins the election, and so he goes about it in an illegal way. He establishes the plumbers. He goes after people who oppose him and uh, goes uh, has the IRS go after their income taxes. He does a variety of illegal things and he authorizes the break-in at the Watergate. What information is he gonna get from the Democratic National Committee? Their candidate is George McGovern. What are they gonna tell him from those files? Not very much, but he's Nixon. And so he does that. He didn't need to do it. And if he didn't, our memory of Nixon would be much more positive but he sullies his image completely by not only approving Watergate, but then committing a felony, an obstruction of justice, thanks to the tapes that we learned about later, by trying to block the FBI from investigating what was clearly a break-in that he had approved. A few Americans step up, John Dean among them, uh, Woodward and Bernstein also, and eventually Nixon is put in a position where the tapes are known and Nixon says, oh, you can't listen to them because it's executive privilege. The Supreme Court uh, renders a unanimous decision that you have to let us listen to those tapes. It's not covered by executive privilege. And as soon as the tapes are listened to, we can hear Nixon obstructing justice. And his resignation comes a short period of time after that. He clearly broke the law and he didn't need to. That's the frustrating thing to me. Nixon was incredibly concerned about his historical legacy. All presidents are usually late in their second term, but Nixon was concerned about that midway in his first term. And Watergate completely ruined whatever it is that he did positively. He is the only president to resign the office he heads back to California and his political career is ended. It was a bad decision to do it. He had no reason to do it. He didn't have to do it. And then his legacy would be fine, but he's Nixon because he couldn't stop himself. And that becomes a bad decision and the last of the 15 decisions that we're going to cover this evening. Now, I see that we have some entries in chat. So I'm gonna have another sip of my ginger ale. And we're gonna take a look at those chats and see if there are some questions in there that I might be able to answer for you. So give me just a minute, let me pull those up. There we go, and let's go to the top. So we have some uh, greetings from Jamie. Hi, Jamie. We have some people reporting how many people are here and that's good. And now we get down to the first comment. Um, was the important decision Jackson and the Trail of Tears the fourth one discussed tonight? Um, 
I believe it was the fourth one discussed. Hang on a second. Um, no, Jackson was five. Uh, Monroe and the Monroe Doctrine was number four. Jackson was number five in case you're keeping track of that at home. All right. Uh, and then we have Monroe Doctrine. Someone else answered that. Uh, and that looks like all the chats, Jamie. I don't see any further chats. So I'm going to say that we have responded to all the chats. So I think we may be at 757. I think we may be near the end, Jamie. Yeah, I think so. Um, that was very informative. And just so everyone knows before you leave, um, this is being recorded. There's a lot of information. I want to go back and revisit some things. Um, so yes, and I should have the um, email out tomorrow with that link, hopefully. Um, so yeah, and I just want to mention too, um, I did really like your Hoover impersonation. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> I practice it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then coming up next week, we have um, Organizing 101. If things are getting a little bit messy at home, you know, people are losing inspiration, you know, keeping, keeping things together, um, that will be January 27th. And we have plenty of spot uh, available there, or plenty of space available there. And then um, beginning that we had mentioned Great Decisions, beginning February 16th is when that is starting. We still have space in the Great Decisions class, and Gary will be leading that. So we're really excited about that. That's um, We'll be meeting eight times uh, in 2021. So feel free to register. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I don't think I see any quick questions there. There, in was, the chat. One, there was one that popped up, and I okay. saw it, and I'm going to respond to it. And um, we almost got to the end of the presentation before a person in the audience said, <laughs> what do you think of President Trump's performance? So let me answer that as an amateur historian. We won't be able to evaluate, to really evaluate, President Trump's presidency for a couple of years. Sorry, we just won't be able to. We have to let some things play out in terms of initiatives that he took and how President Biden continues them or counteracts them. So we're not gonna be able to tell. Now, those of you who follow the C-SPAN ranking of presidents, which I typically mention, sometime in March or so, maybe April, they will do a ranking, which includes President Trump because he's a former president. I do not know where he will go. But whatever the ranking is, it's gonna change as some time passes, people in the administration start writing their memoirs, et cetera. Um, so it will change. And we really won't have a good understanding of that from a historical perspective for probably a couple of years. Sorry, you're gonna have to wait for that one. There, now I think we've covered everything, Jamie. I All think right. so, yep. Okay. That was I'm wonderful, gonna... thank you. Thank you. Yep. All right, I'm gonna sign off. Thanks everyone right. for joining us and good night. Gary, we'll see you next month. Okay.